Welcome to another episode of our Personal Empowerment Audio Series, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our show today, we're going to talk about that amazing vibration when experienced by the ear as a sensation we call music. Music. Music is so many things to so many people. Steve and I, in preparing for this program today, found that for all that we agree on, we've known each other for 35 years, we listen to music together all the time, there's so much that's unique and personal in the way we listen to music. And I think one of those areas has to be my disinterest in lyrics and your fascination with lyrics. Yeah, and I know the tune, but I couldn't tell you what notes they were on the guitar, and your fascination with knowing exactly what chord followed what other chord. We're looking at it completely different ways. For example, we both love the Beatles, but what you love is the sound of the instruments and the sound of the voices together with those instruments and the beat and the rhythm. And what I love is the words that those guys have written that take me on a journey in my mind to see uh, myself on a boat on a river with tangerine trees and marble guys you know so it's like we're both loving the Beatles for totally different reasons you love the way they sound to me one of the most fetching things was when they first appeared on television how one was left-handed one was right-handed and their guitars came together instead of you know facing the same direction the visual of that was so powerful so so many different reasons but the music changes our lives I've been involved in music all my life. I cannot remember a time that I was not interested in music. And I guess it's sort of like anything else. If you're exposed to it as a child, reading for you, well, reading for both of us. You know, if there's books in the house and your parents read, you're likely to read. So if there's music in the house and your parents listen to records or uh, tapes or whatever, then you're likely to be interested in music as well. And let me make clear, before we go too far afield here, I'm listening to lyrics, but not to the meaning of the words so much as as if they were another rhythm instrument. Right. The sound of the voices are an instrument to you. Right. Alliteration, for example. I like a rhyme when it comes around to the end and it resonates with a rhyme. That pleases me. But ask me at the end of the song... To sing the melody, I'll do that. Ask me at the end of the song, what was that about? I often have no idea at all. Yeah, and I can quote it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I, I know the words of the all. I often song. rely on yeah. you to do, <laughs> to do that very thing. So when I'm listening to a song, um, I'm I'm listening to the storyteller, the poet that's listening. For example, I don't really adore classical music. I mean, I appreciate the the power of Beethoven and Bach, and I've heard lots and lots of it, but if I were just, what I feel like listening to, it's very rarely do I listen to, to classical or jazz. I appreciate jazz, or even some great rock like John McLaughlin, uh, who's a brilliant guitar player, but there's no words. And there's no words, I just am not inclined to want to listen to it. I want to hear the story the poet is telling me. And to me, the music is the frame of the picture. It's like, it's wonderful. It wouldn't be the same without it. But if I heard those words spoken, it would still powerfully affect me. The music makes it better. But without the words, it's, it's it's just nice sound. I remember learning this about you, or learning it anew, just a few years ago when... On a trip to Hawaii, you said something about turn off that music. And I thought, what? What, You don't like? I was playing Hawaiian music. It was on the cable TV or something. And and I said, you don't like that? And you said, well, I don't understand the the lyrics. It's in Hawaiian. I I don't understand the words. And I thought... Wow, that's really important to Steve that you understand the yeah, words. Yeah, the same reason I don't like opera. You know, I just don't get the words. I want to speak Italian. I don't speak Italian. I want to know what they're saying, and that's why I'm really attracted to the musicians that are the great lyricists, like Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen and Peter Townsend and you know and Lennon McCartney and Harrison. You know, the great lyricists who also happen to be great musicians. But if those guys walked up to a microphone and merely spoke their poetry, would you find it as fulfilling or rewarding? I would find it on a one to ten, like seven and a half. You know, like yes, but not not everything. But if I just heard the music to While My Guitar Gently Weeps without the lyrics, it wouldn't be half as good. wouldn't even be a quarter as good to me. It's a great song, and I love the guitar solo, and I love the parts that are just musical. But 
to me, it's it's the words that make the music. You know, I, I don't know. It's just that's not right or wrong. I, I you know, no, I write from not. my side, and you're right from your side. It's not. And yet, look, a song like "While My Guitar Gently Weeps" or um, another George Harrison tune that came to mind when you said that something. I look forward to the guitar solo. Yeah. Right. Me too. I'm waiting for you too. Me too. Okay. Me too. So, what is the? This is odd about popular music that there is this uh, pattern or this uh, template where you have verse, verse, chorus, verse, or some variation on that, and then an instrumental solo. Might be the guitar takes it for a little while, and then you go back to the verse. Or, you know, Bobby Keys comes in and does a sax line, or the piano guy does a little bit. What is that little respite in the middle about, and, and why have we come to rely on that? Is it just variety? Well, I think the human attention span kind of thing. You know, we come we come to the end of the attention span. We need a pattern interrupt, and then we can come back and establish another attention span. It's like it's like the best way to teach is to not drone on for a long period of time, but but make quick shifts and then come back. You know, and I think mu- music does the same thing with the the chorus or the refrain or the you know the little thing that goes off to the side. Um, and, and I don't. I think honestly, I don't think I would appreciate just the lyrics without those guitar solos or without those uh, musical interludes as well. And I think the the lyrics without the music underneath them would lack something as as well. But if I if it was just the music, I have to say, why wouldn't I be listening to jazz? You know, why wouldn't I be listening to classical music if it was if just the music would do it? I. I recognize and acknowledge the brilliance of the musicians. I like the, the beats. I like the... T- but that's just not where my mind wants to be. Well, I think a lot of folks would simply see the voice as being another instrument. And the idea of lifting your voice in song and being an instrument, singing a melody or a harmony, those textures certainly add to the music. And there is nothing quite like a, a human voice. I mean, we're Look what Susan Boyle did uh, a few weeks ago with 100 million hits on YouTube in seven days. I mean, that was a global phenomenon where everybody was saying, you got to hear this woman sing, right? Especially you get a look at how she appears, and it's a complete surprise. But having said that, there's something else about the voice, about the lyrics even as rhythm. You know, for example, there's in jazz, scat singing. Or pop music has the doo-wop and the shooby-doo and the la-la-la and the the doo-wah-ditty of it all. Famous syllables we have sung, yeah. (laughs) That's right. And yet, uh, I can do without the story. And you're saying that you want the story as well. Above all. Above all. Above all, I want the story. Above all, I want a story or what the words allow my the, the way they titillate my mind and where they make my mind go how they stretch me how they make me think and feel see I, I wonder if for me it's because i grew up on classical music and playing in a band in high school we didn't have singers <laughs> in the band right so you're playing you know marches when it's football season and but even the concerts we did i remember the christmas show that the high school band did none of those tunes, if you will, those songs had lyrics. We were, you yeah. know, high school bands don't have singers. And so it wasn't until I got into a group, a folk group and then a rock group, that we began to sing songs. And yet here I am all these years later reflecting on it now. And it's like, I've never really thought much about this. In addition to my news work and radio, I've been a DJ and I I never really thought too much about how little attention I've paid to lyrics. And then you and I love so much of the same music, you know. We can sit together and trade iPods and listen to music all day, and yet we're getting something so different out of it. I remember one of the most significant moments of my life uh, involving music and lyrics was... um, in, in my my father left when I was 12 years old. He just deserted the family. I never saw him again. This was the end of uh, 1962. And then uh, John Kennedy, uh, uh, end of 63, and then John Kennedy was assassinated just uh, sh- right about that same time, just shortly after. And then uh, I was, you know, I mean, that was a tough time. I was really sort of depressed. And then uh, on 
the, the new year turned, and then early in February, the new year, appearing on the Ed Sullivan Show were the Beatles. Uh, there was this big, you know, hubbub, the Beatles are coming, you know, the Ed Sullivan is going to be. And, and they sang, um, I Want to Hold Your Hand. And if they just sang, I Want to Kiss Your Lips, it would have been too much. I was 12. But I Want to Hold Your Hand was so perfect. It was the first happy moment that I had since my dad left and Kennedy died. It was the first upbeat feeling I had. It was. It turned my life around. I want to hold your hand. I, I, I want to. I want that too. I want to. I want to. I want to crush on a girl. You know, so I could hold her hand. That's exactly where I was at in in my emotional development. And it was like the happiest I, today. I, I one of the happiest moments of my life was watching them sing that song and the way they looked on stage and the way those words just changed my heart. It just woke me up. It was amazing. Fascinating. Just fascinating to hear you say that because. We're about the same age. I remember that period, and I remember the excitement when that song exploded onto the charts, and I remember the guitar sound. I remember <laughs> I knew the title of the song was I Want to Hold Your Hand. I can't tell you any of the other lyrics, but I remember, I'll always remember, I can bring to mind now, easy peasy, the sound of those guitars. I never heard guitars that sounded quite like that. Well, nobody had ever played bass guitar like Paul McCartney did up to that time. And then George's lead was remarkable. I mean, you know. It yeah. was a lot of stuff. I yeah. mean, the one thing that aspiring musicians did all over the world was find out what guitars are they using, what amplifiers yeah. are they using. Yeah. And in this day and age, young people picking up music, especially pop music, they know about amps that model certain yeah. other amps and you can buy electronic boxes that model particular microphones and other sounds as well as uh, special effects. Jimi Hendrix, for example, though, there's a guy who I could give you some titles, uh, a few lyrics here and there, but I think of Hendrix or anybody else for that matter, even Dylan, I'm more interested in the guitar sound. and so I guess I'm losing out on a lot of stuff, but... I guess I feel like that would be a distraction. I don't think you could pay as much attention to the music as you do and at the same time pay attention to the lyrics as I do. That would be multitasking. That would be dividing attention. Now, you could get... At least on any given pass. Right. 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 You, you could develop the ability to do both at the same time and make them all one thing. Uh, but given that one is not autopilot now, it would take consciousness. It would take awareness to change your autopilot habit and to, to go from just listening to music to listening to just the lyric and then to listening both at once or however you did that. It, it would be distracting. It would be difficult. Yeah. I think we could learn that way early on easily. You know, Some people develop that way. But for me, it's always been, I mean, I like music. I love the sound of musical instruments, uh, some more than others. But even as recently as uh, a couple of months ago, the lyrics of a song changed my relationship. It gave me something important to talk to my wife about. Uh, a, a, a Springsteen song where he said, um, it, you know, I'll wait for you. And if I should fall behind, you wait for me. And I'm going, wow, that's sort of where, you know, like sometimes one takes the lead and sometimes the other. And thinking about that caused a whole major discussion in my relationship you know so lyrics are really significant to me it's like just like reading a book you know it's like it's like intellectual stimulation for me <laughs> part of me wants to say yeah but that's not the music those were the lyrics <laughs> I, I guess and you're right but again if they were just the music alone as much as i love the sound of those instruments i love the sound of an entire symphony orchestra too but i rarely listen Something I learned from a music appreciation class I took, and this surprised me because, again, I've studied music since the fifth grade in, in school, and then uh, just about the time I got out of high school, I was uh, getting into folk groups and rock and roll groups and such. But even though music has been an important part of my whole life, it wasn't until I took this class, I think in junior high, and then I took another one in college, that's right, that somebody suggested taking music apart, the instrumentation, so that you take, let's say, it could be a classical tune or a show tune, but let's just take pop, a pop song, three and a half minute tune you hear on the radio. What if you listened to that and the first time you listened only to, okay, only to the singer, 
You listen to the lyrics, but also the melody. And then you listen to the harmony. Maybe the singer is double-tracking and singing their own harmony, or they have so-called backup singers. But then on the second pass, maybe you listen to just the guitars, right? Or just the lead guitar. And then on the third pass, you isolate in your mind only the bass guitar. Some songs that might be harder to do than other songs. And then on another pass, you listen only to the drummer. I think most people grow old and die and never do that and miss a lot because if you think about it, Stephen, this is a pretty remarkable capacity of consciousness to be able to listen to music and isolate one particular instrument, not to the exclusion of the others, they're still in there, but imagine the ability to focus your attention on one instrument and follow that. You know somebody who plays bass guitar is doing that all the time. They listen to the bass guitar lines, and I'm a guitar player. You know I'm listening to the rhythm guitar and the lead guitar and a keyboard player over there in the corner, they're not listening to the guitars. They're listening to the key- selective consciousness. That's a pretty remarkable faculty. You know, the only time I remember ever doing that was I read uh, an autobiography by Phil Lesh, who was the bass guitar player for the Grateful Dead. And he said he was a classical musician, but not a guitar player. And Jerry Garcia handed him a bass guitar and said, here, learn to play this. And, and so basically he said, all there was was Paul McCartney, and I didn't want to be another Paul McCartney, so I had to like invent a way of playing bass guitar. So I started listening to Grateful Dead songs just to hear the bass, just to see what, what was so unique and different about the way he played bass. And that experience of separating out, not listening to Jerry's guitar and not listening to the music and, the, and, and all the other, and just listening to the bass guitar was really a challenging experience to be able to pull that. I mean, you almost had to feel it more than hear it. You almost had to like get, let your gut get what the bass notes were, you know, and, and t- until your ear like can tune out the rest. It is. It's a great experience in uh, conscious uh, narrowing your awakeness, you know. We could do another show just on selective consciousness. In fact, I think in the mystery school we have, but it's been quite a while. Uh, Not to get off on a tangent, but I want to underscore this. It's important. This is an incredible, again, faculty or facility, if you wish, that we have. To walk into a room, for example, it's not just music. You and I could walk into a mixer, a house party, a chamber of commerce meeting, whatever. And let's say there's 30, 40, 50 people in the room. We could just find a place to stand. And without doing anything extraordinary, shift our awareness from one conversation, that group of two or three people way over there. It's like, hey, Steve, listen to what Joe and Sally are talking about. A tiny bit of lip reading may be involved, but mostly it's like it's sorting out the din. And then without doing anything other than bringing your willpower into play, you can Shift. You don't even need to move your eyes. You right. can do it with your eyes closed. Right. Shift your attention to another conversation over in this other part of the room. There's still this general background din of all these conversations going on, but you're able to isolate this conversation or that conversation. I think that's a great approach to listening to music. Not that it's the only way. But that must be what a conductor does, right? When they're conducting an orchestra, they must be able to do exactly that, to pick out each instrument and the noise it's going to make. And That's an amazing talent. Well, they also it. have the chart in front of them. So they can look down at the music, and they see not only the left hand and the right hand of the piano player, the treble and the bass, but they're seeing all the other parts. You know, if they're following music, they turn the page a lot because right. they're looking at all, everybody's part is in front cool. of them. Cool. And uh, that's a pretty remarkable skill, too. It is to orchestrate. So both things are true to hear the whole yep. and the way it blends, it really helps to have the ability to hear the parts. And to, I don't mean to say critically or even, it's not even a matter of analysis so much, it's just isolating. And again, a suggestion to our listeners now, next time you go to music, or as soon as we're done with this program, you want to go to some music, try that out. Take a tune that you've heard a thousand times that you love, one of your favorite songs, and listen to it with what a Buddhist would call the beginner's mind. Listen to that song that you know so well 
as if you've never heard the song before. Find something in there that's absolutely new. And I think that can be a pretty fun and rewarding exercise. I just have, for some reason, popped in mind the idea of looking at the song from the bottom instead. You know, it's like looking up at the song somehow. Just Would that creating, be starting with the bass? Yeah, then, I guess. Know? I don't know. Just starting a new way of looking <laughs> at the song. Beginners by seeing in a brand new way. And you talked about music in in a, a brand new way that I wasn't familiar with a, a while back when you talked breaking it down into its pieces of rhythm and harmony and melody. What what's, What are the basic constructs of music? Well, that's part of the mystery of music because musical theory is rather arcane. There's something, for example, that musicians know about called the circle of fifths and why this note sounds good in this given key or key signature, like where do you begin, right? The key of C, middle C on the piano. That has no sharps or flats in the key signature. But still, only certain notes work. And then... You know, the guy says, well, let's do this song in the key of F because the singer can't sing well in the key of C. So we're going to go to the key of F. Everybody's got to transpose it. The same song, the same chord progression, but we're starting in a different place on the keyboard. So let's use the piano for a visual. And now the key signature is different. Now, I'm not enough of a musician to say off the top of my head, what is the key signature of F? Is that two sharps or three flats? I don't know. If I knew my circle of fifths and I was a professional musician, I'd know that stuff. But it is rather arcane and a little bit complicated. And part of the magic of music, there's a lot to it. But here's a little trick. The bass and the drums, especially in pop music, the bass and the drums are the engine. That's, that's what drives the whole thing. The drummer sets the rhythm or the pace, the speed at which the music goes. That's the same as the beat? Yeah, the beat. The beat. Yeah, for sure. And the bass player then names the chord. Now, that doesn't mean that's the only note he can play. So if for the next four bars we're going to play a C chord, this bass player, he or she, is going to play that C note. That's pretty much his job. Doesn't mean he can only play the C. He can play a third and a fifth and other notes that are legal. C -ish. They, so they fit in, <laughs> yeah. And if you hit a wrong note, you sure know it. Some notes yeah. are more wrong than other notes. Now, now, to the American ear, but to the India ear, it might not be wrong, Different right? scale. Yeah, different scale. Okay. Different scale. Although, you know... Maybe we'll come back to this. Let me do a little aside about our buddy Pythagoras. All right, the father. Uh, apologies to Aristotle and the Greeks. The father, in many ways, of philosophy. Pythagoras was as much a musician as a mathematician, and the. Uh, how can I explain this? Because again, I have to admit that that I, I don't understand it all that well, but I do know that there are laws in music and even chord progressions and that it is rather arcane. I'm, to go any further is to BS, and I don't want to BS anybody because right. I'm going to get busted here for sure. <laughs> but the relationship of what makes a note legal is, for me, pretty. I've played music all my life. It's I'm like a jazz player in that it's pretty much trial and error. And even the wrong notes could sound okay if you move through it quickly enough. Right? right. Like there's this rule on the guitar, if the two notes that are legal only have one space in between, only have a half step, one fret in the middle, you can play that. But if there's more than one space in the middle. Then you'll really notice it. Be careful, because yeah. there's a very wrong note. <laughs> <laughs> that could go in there. Right. It, it would be discordant is the right. word, right? But basically, the drummer is the guy that, that, that drives the train. He, he, he's got to stay steady. There's a tendency in people to rush music. Nobody's quite sure why that is. There's also a tendency for people to hear sharp. Nobody really knows quite why that is. And middle C on the piano is actually migrating. I do know this, that there are these global meetings that happen every once in a while 
where people in the world get together, professional musicians and scientists and others, and decide whether it's okay to move C up uh, a couple of microtones, a couple of, they're called cents, like pennies, but it's a different meaning. A very fine variation in pitch is wow. called a cent. And so actually we're hearing a little sharper orchestras and bands that are tuning to the same note on the piano it's gotten a little bit sharper that's just a tendency that humanity has as well as speeding up so the drummer's job is to set that tempo to lay down that beat and then keep from rushing you know keep it nice and steady then the bass player comes on top naming the notes the names of the chords that the keyboard player will play with his or her left hand and that the rhythm guitar player is strumming then the keyboard player's right hand and the lead guitar they add the melody and a little bit of passing tones and some noodling on top of that and then if you have lyrics that goes on top of that Wow. So that's sort of the... It's like a seven-layer burrito or something. Yeah, I would say it's sort of the wedding yeah, cake of it cool. all. Yeah. Right. So uh, often you'll see if a group is falling apart in the middle of a song, they're losing track, you'll see people turn to the drummer. They will turn and look at the drummer, and that's sort of a call to get it together again. This guy is law, right? You can't disagree with the drummer. Right? <laughs> He's the loudest voice, so to speak. Uh, when my wife interviewed Willie Nelson a few years ago, we talked about this because Willie is, uh, musicians know that he sort of goes wherever he wants. You know? yeah, <laughs> he right. plays notes that are wrong and right. gets away with it. And his rhythms are he'll get way ahead of himself or he'll get way behind and then have to catch up. So one of the things about Willie's band is unique is that the, well, not unique, but very important is the way the, the bass player and the drummer, most of all, and then his sister plays piano too, they sort of keep it even and steady and consistent. And If they tried to chase him, they'd be all over the map. Yeah, so. you can't follow the yeah. lead guy. Yeah. The lead guy oddly <laughs> follows. Everybody else. Yes, isn't that odd? <laughs> yes. But th that's, that, that's sort of the basics of the way pop music is built around chord progressions. Now, classical music doesn't have chord progressions. It's much more free form. Yeah. And so you don't see people strumming along on a guitar to classical music, right? And yet, if non musicians knew how few variations there really are in classic, in, uh, I'm sorry, in pop music, how few variations there are in pop music, it's all built around the same chord progression. He showed me like three chords on the ukulele That's so it. I could play almost anything. That's it. And. <laughs> The second chord is the fourth. It's the one, four, five chord progression. So wherever you start, let's say you start on C, if that's number one, C, then D, E, F would be the fourth chord, and G would be the fifth. So C, F, G is a chord progression. It's the same as E, A, B, right? It doesn't matter one, where you four, start. One, four, five, wherever you start. That's it. That's it. So it's eight bars on the, it's called the tonic, the number one. And then usually four bars on the fourth chord, and then you go back to the first chord. Then you go to the fifth, then to the fourth, then to the first, and you're home. That's called the turn around. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's like 95% <laughs> of rock and roll, folk, country, and blues. All the same. Right there. Right All there. the same. Yeah. And yet, in that very few numbers of progressions, uh, there's a virtual infinite number of songs that come out of that oh, and yeah. some are exactly identical we were talking about uh, george harrison a long time ago got sued because the song my sweet lord was the exact same song as he's so fine but they don't sound anything alike because the lyrics are so very different in those two songs so sometimes the and the sound of the voice i mean that, that those high girl singers he's so fine and george harrison doing my sweet lord it, it just makes it a completely different the notes could be the same but the music's not the same it's only three notes my sweet Lord, he's so fine. And, and he, poor George, you know, that really... Oh, it hurt him bad. He got scared him, too. It scared him. He had a really hard time. Yeah. Because 
look, ultimately, you've only got seven notes. Yeah, I mean, you know, like of all the possibilities, you know. You get to eight, and that's the same as one. And nine is the same as two. So you've only got seven notes. They're repeated, the octaves, as you go up the scale. But you start thinking, oh, then there's the chromatics. You've got five. In between five of those seven, there are half steps, the black keys on the piano, right? right? right. But again, there's two places where there are no black keys in every octave. It's like, why do you leave that out? Well, it doesn't sound right. Well, why doesn't it sound right? Well, now we're back to the circle of fifths and Pythagoras and math and... You got to find somebody that knows more about music than me to explain that. But it's our. But we all know it. Whether we know it intellectually, we hear a discordant note and we go, "That's wrong." Ow! <laughs> Ow! <laughs> like right. you, feel, like if you're watching a concert and somebody does one of those, you wince for them. You right. know, you go, "Oh, you know that they're never going to live that down." One of the great things about blues is that, besides the regular notes. And the half steps, the chromatics in between. A blues guitar player can bend a string to go in between those. A blues guitar player, or actually any stringed instrument, you can bend, well, not a piano, but that you can put your fingers on, fretted, or like a violin or a, or a bass. They don't do it so much on those instruments. It's primarily guitar where you can choke or bend a string and get a quarter tone. Or a one eighth tone, or a sixteenth of just a slightly. And in the blues, that's one of the appealing or really intriguing things about the sound of blues, especially played on guitar, where they start bending or choking those strings, is they're going places that other instruments can't go. There's no fingering, there's no place that you right. can go to play that. And uh, I don't want to overstate it. You know, a horn player, like a trumpet player, could adjust the tension in his or her mouth and bend the tone a little bit. It's called embouchure. And there are little tricks you can do on other wind instruments, like only partially cover a hole on a clarinet or, or a saxophone using an alternative. There's just so much to it. It's like fascinating. I don't know where to begin. You know, I guess what I feel like saying right now is play music. In addition to listening to music, Play music, whatever it means, even if it's uh, uh, banging on your knees, <laughs> spoons, a kazoo, a harmonica, no wrong notes on a harmonica. You know, dancing is playing music, too. I mean, moving your body to the, to the rhythm, to the sound, to the beat. I think that, that there's some, some playing with music, at least, involved in that, too. So I think we should segue to that, in fact. The whole idea of rhythm beyond melody, of... Why does it feel so good to shake your booty, to get out there and dance? I mean, there are no cultures. Look, we're not that, we haven't been on this earth that long. Uh, and it's only been in the last century, in the last hundred years, that we've even explored all the areas. Human beings a hundred years ago hadn't met all the other human beings. And if they had, there was no way to tell anybody. We didn't have media. But what we now know in the 21st century is there never has been a culture that did not have music and dance. There is something innate, something natural. Primitive, if you will. Say what? Primitive uh, about music. I mean, it's just it's in the, the most primitive of, of cultures uh, created music early, early on. Dancing to their gods or dancing to make the sun or the rain or, you know, this... This goes back as far as we – cave pictures, this goes back as far as we know. There's something that makes you want to tap your toe. There's something about music that makes you want to move your body and, and sway and dance and, and dance. I mean, you know, this is an amazing thing, This both the choreographed uh, dancing together kind of – Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers kind of dancing, and what I grew up with, which is two people flailing their bodies around and looking each other in the eye once in a while. Either way, it's it's the the music the the it's got that backbeat you can't lose it, you know. And and it make it's it, it's a mating ritual, it's a romantic experience, it's a it's a preening, it's a like like birds you know puff out their chests and say like look at me, look at me. It's there's something amazing about uh, the the sexual overtones and connotations of dance. Well, it, dance and music are forms of self-expression. 
And it, it's always rewarding to be able to express yourself, to feel you've communicated something with somebody else. Unless you get one of those wrong notes. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you keep going, it's yeah. not too bad. There you just go. Hit a wrong note, just slide <laughs> out of it, and act like you meant to do it. Yeah. Uh, a guitar teacher told me that a long time ago. He said, if you're going to play a wrong note, act like you meant to do yeah. it, and just keep the moving. The Pee Wee Herman defense. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to do that. But beyond self-expression, it just feels good. I mean, almost everything human beings do, we do because we derive some pleasure, some happiness, some peace, some contentment. In the case of music and dance, even something transcendent. Yep. I mean, some of our listeners might say, Michael, this, uh, Steve, this is uh, human potential and personal development. Why are you talking about music? Because it is transformational. It is. You know, one of my favorite relationship stories with music was uh, quite a few years ago, back in the early 80s, I wanted to make my first cassette tapes, and I realized that my voice alone wouldn't have the same impact as if I had music beneath it, but I didn't know how to make music. And I asked friends, and, you know, the story, I got introduced to this amazing guy named Jack Doherty, who was the founder producer of The Carpenters, and he and I went to his recording studio, and he made the music for my cassette tapes. Now, I knew it had to be about 60 beats per minute. It had to be 4-4 four, four time. I, I had an intellectual understanding of the kind of music I wanted to create to create the alpha brainwave state, to get people to relax, meditative kind of music, new age-ish kind of music. But I didn't know how to create it. And, and Jack had a synthesizer that could make any instrument, and we brought in flute players and, and violinists and all kinds of other... And we created this amazing experience of music that made you want to close your eyes and take a deep breath and go off to your peaceful place and feel safe. Music can make you feel safe. Music can make you feel excited. Music can make you feel sad. Music can make you feel... Music can make you feel. And that's one of the most amazing things about this thing called music, with or without lyrics. Music can make you feel. That and the fact that we're doing a whole program about music with no music in it. <laughs> but here's something interesting about the relaxation music you're talking about which might be called today New Age music or meditation music, or someone might describe it as simply ethereal, guess which element of music gets pulled out. Not the melody, not the harmony. You may or may not have lyrics. It's the rhythm. It's the beat that gets pulled out to make music really relaxing. So... A Stephen Halpern CD it doesn't have a drummer. Oh, interesting. See, there's no... Because a drummer makes you want to march, makes no, you want to move. Well, uh, even if it were, you know, marching is, this is another thing about rhythm, you know. Um, who is the the uh, the inner city preacher that got Barack Obama in so much trouble? Reverend Wright? Yes. Is that his name? Yeah. He did a speech you got back that right. when he, <laughs> with a W. Yeah. When he was uh, in the news and everybody was looking at him, uh, he, he gave a wonder, what I thought was a wonderful speech about just ethnic differences in music and how Western music, if you will, Caucasian music, European white people's music, came down on beats one and three. So it's one, two, three, four, one, two, da 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 It's marching music, right? But black people's music, whether it was African or Caribbean, comes down on the two and four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, <laughs> one, two. Wow. And that's where you get the boogie and the beat and the shuffle and, the, and, and uh, again, this whole, even funk, right? Now you start to syncopate it and get a little offbeat. But it's really true. I mean, culturally, our rhythms are even different. Right? It's very different. One of the things we love in the West about rock and roll is that it comes down onto and Listen to the drummer in a Springsteen song. It sounds like somebody is shooting a pistol on two and four. One, bam, two, bam, two, you know, the explosion. Oh, the USA, is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> bam. The explosion is on two and four. And that all comes from the culture of black people, people of color. That's their, you know, that's, that's their rhythm, so to speak. Now, it's all good, you know, it's all good. 
And often in a classical piece, you'll have all kinds of rhythms. There's things called triplets, for example, where you mix three beats into the space that normally you'd only have two, and syncopation that I already mentioned. There's just so much to this. One of the things I want to encourage people to do who are listening to us today is get some sort of instrument in play or sing or, like Steve was saying, tap your toes or slap your knees or learn to play spoons or just anything. Lift your voice in song. It's natural. It's instinctual. It's innate. It's a form of self-expression. It feels good. And I think... I think there's even something celestial about it. If you think of, again, all these cultures and all these societies carry also the idea that wherever we go when we die, uh, there's music there. I don't know if if Dante ever talked about music in hell. You don't hear about music being in hell. I remember a Saturday Night Live where Paul Simon was stuck in an elevator playing elevator versions of the Simon and Garfunkel songs, and that was hell. (laughs) For the rest of (laughs) eternity, that would be hell. (laughs) Oh, that's very good. But the idea of uh, a celestial chorus or the angels playing harps is rather profound if you think about spirit as energy being vibration and what is sound and what is music but vibration and why are some notes legal and some notes bad what is the nature of harmony the vibrations overlap they fit a note that sounds bad has a frequency that doesn't fit with the first frequency the primary frequency the tonic note or the key that you're playing in those vibrations beat against each other. And it's like two tastes that just don't go together. Exactly. Yeah. It exactly. just doesn't work. It just doesn't fit. Or in physics, destructive wave motion. Two waves come together at different frequencies and they cancel each other out. Right. Constructive wave motion in physics would be like harmony. Where uh, a note and another note, eight notes higher, you, you play the, both of them would vibrate together. Particularly the third and the fifth. That's a major chord. Uh, the one, and then two notes above that, the third, and two notes above that, the fifth. That's your primary. And then if you want three more notes, you'd have the octave. The whole eight octave. Yeah. Right. And it's also interesting, I think, to note that as recently as the early Renaissance in Europe, the church banned certain chords and certain notes. For example, in addition to the beat on two and four that we talk about in rock and roll, there is a heavy emphasis on the seventh, okay? The note just one before the octave, right? That note screams devil music. (laughs) It vibrates you way down in the base of your spine. It's what makes you want to get up and rock and roll and dance and stand on your chair and scream. Well, the church banned that for hundreds and hundreds of years Composers were not allowed to put a chord with a seventh note because it conjured up lascivious, lewd, lust, you know, fornication, sex, drinking. It just felt too wonderful, right? So the purest harmony was the octave, the same note, doubled in frequency. That's an octave, right? So if A is 440 cycles, the next a on the piano is 880 and down here at 220 is another a so it's all math it's all vibration and get into it you don't have to be skilled you don't have to everybody loves music i mean i can't imagine somebody just not liking any kind of music that well you know be... it exercises the brain in a way that only learning foreign language and learning higher mathematics do those three things really do very special things for making you smarter you know making your intelligence grow uh so so listen to music for the value it has in developing your brain listen to music even if you don't listen to the lyrics, listen to the music in terms of noticing how it feels in your body and then separate the different instruments and use the ability to focus your mind more clearly by seeing this instrument or hearing that instrument. I, I kind of like to uh, 
memorize lyrics. I, I don't know that many people spend as much time and energy in that as I do. But for me, it, it feels wonderful to just know when a song comes on. I can sing that whole song all the way through. You know, it's just it's a great feeling. I feel proud of myself. I feel like, you know, it's really, it really feels nice. And, and it's good exercise for my memory. And I have a fantastic memory, and that's one of the reasons I consistently exercise it that way. You know, I think if we had Albert Einstein with us here, he'd chime in on this whole idea because he's really the first Western scientist to say we've only got two things at work in the universe. There's this material stuff, and then there's energy, and they're convertible. Like the material stuff is really energy that is slowed down to the point that it appears to be solid. We know it's not solid, But it's solid enough, right, that we can rely on it, especially heavy metals and what have you. You can get in your car and know it's not going to vaporize and turn into energy. Um, That would make make materialism really a drag, wouldn't it, if it just converted (laughs) to to Entropy instantly. Well, again, from a spiritual point of view, spirit is energy. And... Everything that is convertible, everything is vibration ultimately, and that we would find pleasure in vibration is really a call to the soul, uh, the language of the soul. Uh, Music refreshes the soul, or as you said before, is that a Shakespeare line about music soothes the savage beast breast? Breast. It's actually breast, right? It's breast, and I think it's biblical. Is it? I think. I'm not certain of that. It might be Shakespeare. It can't, what, the, what it's saying, the reason it's so easily confused, and people often say beast, is that it tranquilizes you, it tames you, it domesticates you. Yeah, calms it's also the down. church probably said breast is a word you don't want to be using. That because, be. You know, and actually what it meant was heart or emotions. It didn't mean, you know, breast, you know. Well, like love is yeah. associated with the heart, even yeah. though that's a thing that pumps blood. But I think there's something here, and... As we do an audio journey, consider that ultimately all music is vibration. Something is vibrating. A string is vibrating on the piano, on the guitar, on the violin. A vocal cord is vibrating. A vocal cord is vibrating. The sound coming out of a trumpet or a clarinet or a saxophone is vibrating. And it causes in your brain vibrations. Hopefully you're picking up good vibrations. There you go. So there's something ultimately spiritual about music and something ultimately spiritual about all things. We're not talking religion here. We're talking the building blocks of the universe. There's energy and mass in Einstein's language. There's spirit and material stuff. Another way of saying the same thing. Today we're talking about music as an expression of spirit. It's not a thing. You can't hold it and cut it up and, you know, put it in the wastebasket. It's it's energy. Right. And it's very much influencing the human spirit. So with a deep breath, hold for a moment at the peak. Eyes close as it feels comfortable. And then as you release, feeling peace. Feeling peace. Even though you probably don't feel it consciously, there is a metronome in the center of your body. Your heart is rhythmic. Sometimes the heart goes faster when you're excited and get worked up. It's pumping more blood. Other times, like now, you take a breath, you relax, and you feel safe. That rhythm slows. Imagine your heart slowing in a very natural way. Everything's slowing down, but there's always rhythm. And you are rhythmic. And all around you dances musical rhythms. And our job 
to live a rewarding, productive, meaningful, and fulfilling life includes harmonizing our natural rhythms with the rhythms all around us, the rhythms of other people, and the rhythms of life. From the longest of rhythms, the year that it takes the earth to cycle around the sun, the day that it takes the earth to rotate on its axis, to everything there is a season, there is a rhythm. Just consider that you are that vibration. And when you find that things go wrong, you can lift your heart in song. And much to your delight, that somehow makes it right. Music can change how you feel. Music can make you heal. So, sing a little song, hum a little tune. You can do it with a whistle, you can do it with a croon, but let music pervade. Be the backbeat of your day. Use it to help you through work and to guide you to play. Sometimes just a song or two will change your very mood. Sometimes just a interlude. <sighs> Listen while you eat food or when you take a break. Music. Let it take you away to a place that you most choose to be. Music can change you. Music can change your reality. As you listen to different kinds of music, either in the background or consciously focus your attention upon the music you're listening to, Ask yourself, become aware of where in your body you feel that music. For example, think of loud, heavy metal rock and roll. Even if no particular tune comes to mind, just get a sense of heavy metal music. Maybe you love it, maybe you hate it, maybe you come down somewhere in the middle. But be aware in your body, not in your head, but in your body, where does that music hit you? Where does it impact you? And then think of another kind of music, basic rock and roll. Where does that, where in your body is that felt? Or a sweet, sweet melody that lifts your spirit and seems almost transcendent. I'll bet there's a different place, maybe a higher location in your body where you feel that frequency, that style of music. And so I would have you consider that your whole being is an instrument. Your body your physical body, your etheric body, your emotional body, the various ways that you sense yourself in this world, become aware of how music resonates within those spheres, in that physical body. And not only in a more literal way as a singer would refer to their vocal cords and their lungs and that whole system as their instrument. Think of your body from the top of your head to the soles of your feet as being an instrument. And make music. And let music remake you. 
choose music to stimulate you. Choose music to sedate you. Choose music to set up your mood. And create music. As you walk, as you talk, create music in your heart when you start. Have a beat. Have a beat that you meet. Feel it. Feel the beat. Feel the natural rhythm, the natural harmony of you. As you take a deep breath and bring yourself back to wide awake. Feel the music, make music, and let music remake you. Well, I certainly have enjoyed this show. This time went so fast. That's how I know I'm having fun yeah. when time just really flies. In fact, uh, I feel like uh, we've made some important points, I know, because I want to go pick up a guitar or uh, <laughs> fiddle around on a keyboard. Where's my iPod? Where's my iPod? Yeah. Don't be intimidated by music. Don't feel like you have to be a performer or a professional I make much more bad music than good music, but it's all music and it's all fun. Uh, never uh, worry about whether you have a good voice or a good ear. Just sing the song anyway. Be the music. It's all vibration. It's all rhythm. Again, there's melody. There's harmony. There's a lot to it. But don't deny it to yourself because somewhere along the way, maybe somebody told you that, you couldn't play that instrument very well, and you gave. I mean, how many people took a year or two of piano as a little kid and gave it up and said, oh, "I just, I can't do that." And then the rest of your life, you deny yourself access to that music. I've never taken a single piano lesson. I can't even play a chord on the piano. I have to, I have to sort of count to figure out where I am. But if I see one, I go over to it and I start banging away on it, or Maybe not banging on it, but just, you know, pressing the keys. Uh, you don't have to be great. You don't have to be good. You just have to want to express yourself through music in whatever way is possible. and uh, Give yourself permission to do that. Sing, dance, and play. Yeah. Make music an important part of your life. Yeah. Hey, I want to remind you that uh, somewhere around the end of May, uh, first part of June, it's possible that you find that the feed of these programs goes away. And I want you not to worry about that because as a contributor or a subscriber, all it means is that you're still using the old manual system, which we're now going to begin to fade out. And so if you are a contributor or a subscriber and you find that happens in a couple of weeks, suddenly you stop getting your feeds, hey, go to the website, focusedpassion.com, Use your email as a username and the password you were given. And all of the programs will still be in the player and you can resubscribe. Just hit either the RSS button to listen with your browser or hit the iTunes button or use the built-in player. It's always going to be at focusedpassion.com. So if your feed suddenly goes away, don't worry about it. If you say, hey, wait a minute. I never got a password, or I lost my password, or the old password doesn't work in the new system. We've got a special field that says forgotten password. Just request a new one, then you can get in and either listen with the built-in player or resubscribe to the RSS feed in your browser or iTunes. It's easy. I just want to give you a heads up because that's going to happen in the next few weeks for a some small percentage of people. Most of you will be unaffected, but I wanted to mention that before we run. And, uh, of course, we want people to use the Share One with a Friend gadget, too. There's lots of reasons, really, to go to the FocusedPassion.com website. If you have friends that have problems or need their hearts healed, those are the places to go. Send them what they really need to hear. We have the stuff. We just don't know who needs what. We need you to help us send the people that need to hear these programs, the programs they most need to hear. That's it. Share what you care about. Thanks so much. Mahalo from Hawaii. And as always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. Aloha. <laughs>